Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Go ahead and give the Lord praise this morning. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We worship you. Lord, we want to be filled with your spirit. We want to go back, as you told the church of Ephesus, to go back and do the first works. Lord, you want us to love you like we did in the beginning when we were first born again. And you want us to be joyful in those things, Lord, in prayer and studying your, your word, the Bible. Lord, you want us to rejoice in those things and not let this world distract us or pull us away. So, Lord, I come to you today and I just pray again, your kingdom come and your will be done. Speak to our hearts and change our lives in Jesus' name. Somebody said amen. 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 You may be seated this morning. Good to have everybody here today. Hallelujah. Wow. Still got some seats in the middle. I don't know why everybody hates the middle spot right there. But <laughs> We are, Miss, that's Gary. Gary and Susan supposed to be there. Yeah, that's right. Hallelujah. Well, uh, I want you to take your Bibles out. And, and for those of you who think that oh, that last song, you've never heard it before and it sounded old, it is old. It's from the, the 70s, and that's Keith Green. And if you want some, some music that's got some message to it, uh, go find you some Keith Green stuff. He uh, died in a plane crash in 1982, I believe it was, and... Uh, he was uh, something special. He is definitely missed. I think the Jesuits actually had him killed because his last thing he did was he had Last Days magazine. And at the time, it was the most circulated Christian magazine in the world. And he had just started a series called The Catholic Chronicles, exposing the Catholic Church. And then his private small aircraft uh, goes down and kills 11 people, including two of his children with him. Uh, but the Jesuits and the CIA, their their specialty is taking down small aircraft. So, you know, if if they're bullseyes on you, probably not wise to get in a small plane. Um, but uh, he is he has been missed. I want you to uh, take your Bibles out this morning. We're going to go through a few scriptures today. Um, this is just a lot of my mind. But I, I want to go to first Ephesians chapter six. Everybody ought to know this. I probably most of you should be able to quote this. Ephesians 6.12, and then we're going to put up 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 again. These are scriptures that I cover a lot, but we're going to go somewhere else with them today. Um, Ephesians 6, though, just to remind you, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, somebody say the schemes, plots, plans. The devil has schemes and plots and plans for you, all right? You're to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against those. And then he tells us this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high or heavenly places. And then he says to take the whole armor of God. Now, you've got to remember something. You are constantly, daily, at war with these unseen spirits. And some of them are more powerful than others. There are classes of them. That's why he says there's principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. Um, I've seen... In the spirit at times, the Lord has allowed me through the gift of discerning of spirits to actually see different types of demons. I've seen little, little horn, I call them little horn monkey demons that are about this big that like to latch on and jump on to people. I've had times in my life where the Lord's allowed me to see a principality. And the principality, one of them that came to my house in 1998, he was huge. I mean, he was about eight feet tall muscular but it's like he had scales over him he had these these straight up horns and these glowing red eyes and uh, the Lord allowed me to see him and then so there's there's different ones and they have different uh, they have different powers and abilities you know when Jesus was casting demons out of people he comes up to the deaf and dumb you know the child that had the deaf and was deaf and dumb and he said you deaf and dumb spirit come out of him it's not complicated right 
You, you can name them. You can address them by what they're doing. Spirits of lust, what do you think they're going to do to you? Make you lust. Now, you know, there's Bible, there's, there's spirits written in the Bible. Like, for instance, the spirit of whoredoms. That would be a strong man over lust and sexual immorality. And so all those spirits, they, they would be listed under that, like fornication and adultery and on down the line. Um, the Bible talks about, again, there's the spirit of fear. There's a perverse spirit. There's the spirit of error in the Bible mentioned. There's the uh, spirit of infirmity, right? Spirit of, uh, oh gosh, what am I? There, there, there's just numerous. There's legion, of course. And then there's uh, the deaf and dumb spirit. And there's the spirit of, uh, uh, what is it, terror and things of that nature. So what I'm getting at is there's different spirits that do different things, all right? And, you know, we get, sometimes we get the spirit, you know, we, there, there's part of the body of Christ that gets in, you know, the spirit of, uh, Ingrown toenail. Now, we're going a little too far there, okay? All right? But there are spirits that, like, for instance, remember when John the Baptist came, and the big, the big argument that the Pharisees had about Jesus being the Messiah, and the, their, their argument that he was not, they said, well, Elijah must come first, because there was a prophecy that said that Elijah would show up first. Well, what did Jesus tell the apostles? They said, truly, Elijah, he said, truly, Elijah has come first. And remember, it was prophesied over John the Baptist that he would come in the spirit of Elijah. So if there can be a spirit of Elijah, there can be the spirit of something else, too, for somebody else from the Bible. Now, I want to tell you this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about the spirit of Jezebel this morning. All right. And I'm a little sick and tired of it. It's probably one of the most abused within the Pentecostal and Charismatic realm. It's probably one of the most abused and misunderstood and misused terms. Because I just think anybody, you know, if, if you've got a strong, sassy woman, then she's got the spirit of Jezebel. That does, that's not what it is. Right? Never has been. We're going to look at what it is. Because this spirit, this spirit is so strong that it made Elijah depressed and want to die. And God actually had to raise up somebody else with a more aggressive, bold, and strong spirit to actually deal with Jezebel named Jehu. But think about how powerful and anointed that Elijah was that even this witch Jezebel could cause him to run, could cause him to flee, could cause him to be depressed, so depressed that he didn't want to live anymore. That's a powerful witch. And the Bible says Jezebel, if you want to write down the first, the first characteristic of the spirit of Jezebel, they called Jezebel in the Old Testament, called her a witch. All right, now let me define witchcraft for you. Sometimes we want to think about a witch that's, that's you know, lighting candles and doing little, her little incantations inside of a pentagram, and, and that is true. That stuff does happen. There are people that do that. But witchcraft is simply people that want to manipulate you away from the will of God or the word of God or the truth in some manner, and they use manipulation. Sometimes the manipulation is threats. Sometimes it's appealing to your pride or to your greed or to your lust. But they will do anything to seduce you and to manipulate you. That's witchcraft. There's a lot. Of, I, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of Christians that operate in witchcraft. Because what we should do, you know what I love my, what my wife does. People call my wife all the time and say, what should I do about this and what should I do about that? And you know what she tells them? What, do you, what does she tell them? Pray about it. Everybody says that. Pray about it. Pray about it. You should pray about it. Why? Because she's not trying to control your life, nor am I. I'm going to tell you. You ask me, should I move here? Should I move there? Should I do this? Should I do that? I'm going to say, pray about it. You need to hear from God. Now, if there comes a point, there will come a point sometimes, even in the, in the church as a pastor or as a prophet or as a, in authority, where if I feel like from the Lord that you're going off, off the reservation really far, I'm going to say, hey, you better check this. You better reexamine this. I think you're going in the wrong direction. But for the most part, I try to stay away from that, and so does my wife. Now, another reason I'm, 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 God's been dealing with me about this for several weeks, several weeks, and I've just kind of been praying and waiting on the Lord to deal with this. 
Now, here's what's interesting, and I'm going to address this this morning, but it has come to my attention, you know, we find out these little things, that a family that left this church are work, happened to be working in the same place with another member of our church in the same job and the same thing. And so um, our dear brother Sean was trying to witness to a couple who are not saved and need deliverance in a bad way and had them looking into our deliverance messages and to get them some help, hopefully get them saved, get them delivered. But because this family who got themselves offended, who left the church, also the husband works there, tells this man who's seeking help from our ministry, don't, don't, don't have anything to do with that church or ministry because his wife is a Jezebel. Talking about my wife. Yeah. This is, this is how evil this stuff gets out there. Now, what's interesting is that the, 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 the husband of the family that left is calling my wife a Jezebel, left here because they followed a Jezebel right out the door. And this spirit is powerful, and it will affect, if you don't, if you don't watch yourself, it will have an effect on str even strong Christians, okay? And they can come under the influence of that thing. But I'm going to show you why that, again, just because someone, uh, a female, happens to be a strong leader, and God calls women to be in ministry and in leadership, just because there's a woman, that doesn't mean she has the spirit of Jezebel, folks. And calling my wife a Jezebel is about as crazy as it is, because that's calling me an Ahab, and I don't think I'm that weak or wicked. My wife doesn't order me around or push me around at all. So that would be, I find this thing's odd, but, but here's what, what bothers me. That's why you better be careful when you get offended and you get bitter at other Christians or a pastor or a church. Because what you end up doing is you end up going out, and that the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews. When you go out, it says that root of bitterness, once it springs up, it will cause others to fall you will you will poison others with your bitterness and when you start getting in the way and hindering people who want to get saved or get delivered from demons and you you become the obstacle then you're going to be under the judgment of God and it's just that simple you remember the story where Paul and Barnabas were on their, their missionary journey there, and uh, that uh, they were trying to lead Sergius Paulus to the Lord. And they had this Ilimus, a false prophet named Ilimus, the sorcerer, that, that got in the way and tried to interfere with, you know, Sergius Paulus getting saved. And Paul just said, the Lord smites you with blindness, just smote him with blindness, right? The judgment of God, not to destroy him, but letting him know you are an obstacle now to somebody getting saved. Y'all ought to say this. I don't want to be, say this with me, an obstacle. But if you get offended and bitter and you let this spirit of Jezebel take over your life, you're going to attack the prophets of God, the true prophets. If you want to make it this, we, we've, got, we've got number one about Jezebel. She was a witch, so she was a manipulator. Okay, she wanted her way. This was a problem with all the Christians. They want their way. All right. The second thing about her is she hates. I, when I use the word hate, I mean hate. She hates true prophets of God. She hates people. Why does she hate prophets? Because prophets discern her and hear from the Lord about her. And true prophets will confront her and expose her. And I'm using her because we're not caught up on pronouns in here, right? Now, this spirit can be on a woman. It can be on a man. It's a spirit. But she hates it. She's fine with weak leaders who let her do what she wants to do, which is seduce and lead people. I'm going to show you this. Let's, let's go. She seduces people into sin 
and false doctrine, and not necessarily in that order. But let's go to the book of Revelation as we deal with this spirit this morning. Revelation chapter number two. Revelation 2, and we're going to go down to verse 18, and we're going to read this whole thing here. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath the eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first, notwithstanding. I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest at Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, what doctrine? This spirit of Jezebel, which have not known the depths of Satan. Somebody say the depths of Satan. As they speak, I will put upon you none other burden but that which you have already hold fast till i come he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will i give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and i will give him the morning star he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches now i believe these messages from jesus through that he gave to John for the churches, I believe they're for us today, okay? Because you can always see, like if you go back to the church of Ephesus, what was their problem? They were faithful. They were testing those who were apostles and found them liars. I mean, they were discerning. They were hard at work for the kingdom of God. But Jesus had to say, well, there's one thing I have against you, church of Ephesus. You have left your first love. Go do your first work, right? Now, we can see that. That's a principle there. That we can be busy for the Lord and yet lose our first love for him. Lose our first dedication, especially if ministry gets busy. You know, you can get too busy, right, even for the Lord. Well, these messages here, this one, it's interesting. This woman may or may not have been named Jezebel. This may have been Jesus identifying the spirit in which she was working under. Because these pastors and leaders of the church of Thyatira would have been very familiar with Jezebel of the Old Testament because that's a famous story right there, covering the days of Elijah, then Elisha, and then Jehu. So it's a pretty famous story, right? So they would have known. And if you, even if you go back into the Old Testament, you find that Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, who was married to Ahab, you find that she was a very religious person. She was spiritual. Well, when you hear people say, you ask them if they're following Jesus, and they go, well, I'm spiritual. Red flag. Being spiritual without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're committed to the Bible, to the Word of God, if that's not where your spiritual is, then it's another spirit working there. All right? But remember, uh, uh, Jezebel, she had 450 prophets that sat and ate at her table. She was probably what most theologians believe. She was probably also the high priestess of the uh, Asherah worship that was there that Ahab had allowed now to come into Israel and Judah through her. But she also hated the prophets. Even if you go back there, she was killing. She was murdering prophets. Remember, Obadiah said, what? I was hiding 
a hundred prophets, fifty by fifty, in caves and feeding them with bread and water because a lot because Jezebel was trying to kill all the prophets of the Lord. See, this is this is the level of hatred that this spirit has for the true prophetic. Now, in here, what Jesus has to rebuke this, this church, and, and he, when, he, when he says to the angel of the church of Thyatira, it's not an angel. It's, the word angel just means messenger. It can mean an angel from heaven, or it can mean just any messenger, like me or anybody else. I believe he's talking to the pastor. All right? And he's saying... You've got a problem. You guys have faith. You have charity. You have good works. You have a lot going on for you. You're Christians. But this one thing I have here, you are allowing Jezebel. See, this is something we need to understand. Everybody thinks Jezebel usurps authority. No, she slides in and is allowed to do her stuff. And this is the problem. We Christians, a lot of times, we allow these spirits to work and operate instead of binding them and casting them out of our lives. So you can tolerate, you can allow her. But let me tell you what the spirit of Jezebel is going to do. This is why it's, it's not because a woman has a strong leadership gift. What the spirit of Jezebel is going to do, and it'll work through people, but what the spirit of Jezebel wants to do is, number one, teach false doctrine. He wants to slide in false teaching. So that accusation against my wife, my wife is not trying to bring in false teaching into our church. Real simple. Nor is she trying to lure people into sexual immorality. This is another thing that Jezebel does. It tries to get you to relax your morality and not obey God's commands when it comes to sexual purity. You hear me? So when you can know that spirit's operating, when it's trying to operate against you and, and seduce you to believe an error, a false teaching, and then trying to lure you into casting off self-control and restraint. Now, also, we find out that Jezebel, you know, Jezebel was named after Baal. Her Canaanite, Phoenician background, she was, they were Baal worshipers. But let me tell you, a lot of Christians are Baal worshipers. And don't even know it. Let me tell you why. Baal. What was Baal? Baal was the god of storms and rain. Which represent what? Rain represents the blessing of God, right? If you're, if you're a country of farmers and that's how you live, that's how you survive, guess what you got to have on those crops? You got to have rain. Especially in the Middle East. I've been to the Middle East. I spent time there. It's dry. Matter of fact, when I was in the Middle East, for a month, it did not rain. So the blessing of God. So you got Baal, the god of storm and or rain. And he's also a god, a demon god of fertility rights and lust. Fornication, adultery, perversion. Now, think about this. Christianity today, I'm going to tell you why most of Christianity in America has been seduced by the Jezebel spirit. Because you can see it. They have adopted false doctrines like of once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. They have adopted doctrines of gain is godliness, prosperity, you got to prosper. God's will for all of us to be rich. And if you see, and then, and then most churches are full of fornication, adultery, pornography. So if I'm looking at false doctrine, false prosperity, thinking God's blessing, I, 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 I'm in this for God's blessing. 
And there's all this compromise, this sexual immorality. Are you worshiping and following Jesus Christ or Baal? See, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. These same demon gods from the Old Testament, they're still with us. They just slither in different ways. But remember with Elijah, what did Elijah do? God sent him to confront the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asher. Actually, it was 850 of them. And when Elijah confronted them and then killed them, once God answered by fire, which God is true, because Baal had become a substitute for the children of Israel. Think about that. Even the word Baal means Lord or husband. So they were running around saying the Lord did this and the Lord did that and I'm serving the Lord when they were serving Baal. And Elijah has to say, how long are you going to be between these two opinions? If Baal is God, serve him. If Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, if the God of Abraham, Isaac, if he's God, then serve him. And the God who answers by fire. So, uh, you know, they do the sacrifice and the prophets of Baal call on Baal and nothing happens. But what did he say? What did Elijah say? The God who answers by fire. And Elijah put his sacrifice on and boom, the fire comes down. But then Jezebel comes out. And she said, the gods do so to me too if you are not dead. Well, she wanted him dead. And this is what's so evil. People that get under this spirit, Christians that get under this spirit, let me, I'm going to tell you right now. If something happened to me and I died, there would be Christians rejoicing. They would be rejoicing. Especially some of these that are offended and left and, and keep running their mouth. Say, Pastor Dean, how do you know that? Oh, I know it. I hear it from the Lord when I pray for them. See, the Bible talks about this in, in 1 John chapter 3. It talks about he who hates his brother, you can put that up for me, is a murderer. Y'all need to understand something. And this is something that's going to help you too. When people hate you, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, when they hate you, they allow, that allows, that sin of hatred allows a demon spirit to come in to them and use their human spirit to afflict and attack you. Oh, believe me, I know because I've been afflicted by these, by hatred. I have to break the curses of hatred, bind the demons of hatred and the demons assisting human spirits in astral projection coming against me i remember back years many years ago when i used to go to larry lee's church in rockwall texas church on the rock he had been the pastor at a big baptist church in dallas texas he uh, larry had been the youth pastor there and his pastor whose name was howard Canancer at the time his pastor was you know they were huge in the baptist denomination they were some of the most famous well-known preachers of that time and Larry took the job of being youth pastor there right after he came out of Dallas Theological Seminary but Larry was different because Larry was full of the Holy Spirit Larry while he was at at, at the uh, Baptist Seminary got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and was laying hands on all different people that were in the seminary and they were getting filled with the Holy Spirit he got called into the administration office told him to stop laying hands on people Okay, so Larry was different. So when Larry takes this job to be the youth pastor at this big Baptist church in Dallas, Texas, well, all of a sudden revival starts happening among the youth and they go from, you know, a hundred or so to a thousand, a thousand young people, right? And then Howard Knatzer, the pastor, the senior pastor, starts believing in healing and they start having healing services at this big Baptist church. Well, let me tell you something, Larry Lee, and I heard Larry Lee talk about this. I'm sitting in the front row of Church on the Rock when he's telling this story. And he said, the hatred that came against my pastor from other Baptist pastors simply because, 
we started having revival and God started moving and people started being healed. He said, the hatred that came against my pastor, he said, was unbelievable. And right after that, Howard can answer, got cancer and died. And Larry Lee says, I'm going to tell you right now, it wasn't witchcraft. It was the hatred of other Christians. You see it? First John 315, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. See, and then Christians are too some of the greatest deniers when they have hatred or unforgiveness. Oh no, I'm I'm not offended. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Well, let me give you the, de the definition of hatred. I've, I've shared this before. You can look it up in the Strong's Greek Dictionary. It means to love less. To love less than you should. And I'm going to tell you right now, if deep down in your heart, you're, you're so hurt or offended or bitter towards someone that you are deep down really longing for something bad to happen in their lives. That's hatred. Ill will is hatred. This is why you better check yourself. Because really what this is deep down is hatred, this bitterness, this offense. It's the spirit of murder. It's the spirit of Jezebel. And it tries to hide. Remember, she was a murderer. She was killing prophets and she wanted to kill Elijah. But see, Christians now, we don't run around killing folks. That'd be too obvious. We're not Muslims. But in our heart, we hate people. We want to see other people destroyed. We want to see pastors and churches and ministries brought down to the ground. And I'm not talking about bad ones. There are people that want good ones brought to the ground. There are Christians now. We are one of the most hated, despised churches in this whole region. Even by other pastors and churches. Simply because I tell the truth. You see, the leaders in Thyatira were weak. They were weak. They allowed her to do this. And right now, the churches in America, they allow false doctrine, sexual immorality, compromise, lukewarmness. They allow this to just go on in their church 24-7, seven, seven days a week for years at a time. And they say nothing because they're weak. They're weak. They're, they, they, they operate by the fear of men. And they allow people to teach their small groups and their Sunday school classes that are complete false teachers and false prophets and false prophetesses. Remember, she claimed to be a prophet. She said, he, she calls herself a prophetess. Oh, the Lord speaks to me. Thus saith the Lord, brother. And she was a teacher. So she was teaching the word, but she was teaching things that seduced people into sin and sexual immorality. Look, the moment you teach, I, I'll tell you this right now. I saw one of my best friends I led to the Lord back in 1987. When I, when I first came back here, I led my best friend, two of my best friends, I led them to Jesus. Then I led them into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was teaching, we were doing Bible studies, and I was teaching them the Word of God. But then I had to leave for a little while and go back to Arkansas to help this girl who had come out of Satanism. And so I go back to Arkansas for a little bit. And when I come back, I was only gone about two months. When I come back, my friend has gotten with this other friend of ours whose dad is a deacon at First Baptist Church. And the next thing I know, I find out that my friend that I led to the Lord who was on fire for the Lord when I left was back to smoking dope, drinking, and having sex with his girlfriend. 
Even though I had taught him, true repentance is you quit the drugs, you quit the alcohol, you quit the sexual immorality. And I gave him scripture for it. I taught them true repentance before I left. But because this Baptist deacon taught him that he was once saved, always saved, no matter how he lived, and he didn't have to worry too much about being strict in his walk with God or walking after holiness and righteousness, all of a sudden he thinks, well, if I'm once saved, always saved, no matter how I live, if I'm eternally secure, no matter what, then I can still have sexual sin. I can still have drugs and alcohol in my life. And God, God's already forgiven my sins, past, present, and future. I'm good. That's why, you want to know why I wrote a book about this, why I rail against this false doctrine of once saved, always saved, or eternal security? Because that's what it does. It's a false doctrine that seduces the people of God into thinking their immoral acts are not going to bring them into hell or into judgment. See, that's what I believe. If you want to ask me, you say, what do I, what do I think Jezebel was teaching in the church of Thyatira? Just that. God's grace and love. And this is how they do it. Oh, God's grace just covers you. God just loves you. He would never send you to hell. He understands your sexual needs. You're a child of God. He's never sent you to hell for being a fornicator or an adulterer or a homosexual. This is how Jezebel seduces. It's talk, all, a lot of talk about love and grace and security. And you know what that removes? It doesn't just remove people from, from true doctrine. It removes the fear of the Lord from their lives. They love, let me tell you something right now, the people who are, who, are, who are taken over by this spirit of Jezebel, oh yeah, they, they don't like the fear of the Lord. Oh, they come up with all kinds of doctrine. It doesn't mean fear, the word phobios doesn't mean fear, even though we use phobia for everything, every fear under the sun. And actually, if you look up the word fear in the New Testament, phobios or phobios, guess what it means? Fear. To be terrified, to be afraid. You say, Pastor Dean, am I supposed to walk around afraid of the Lord? No, what you're supposed to do is walk around and go, if I sin against the Lord, if I live in sin, if I live in rebellion, if I live in sexual immorality, if I live in idolatry or covetous, if I live in sin habitually, I need to be afraid because I know that God is going to keep his word. Even though he loves me, he will judge me according to the written word of God. You know, remember in the, book of, in the book of Revelation, I want you to go over to chapter 20 real quick. I'm going to show you something. As we got psychos, I was on an interview this past week with another pastor who's having to confront the error of the Mandela effect that claims that the Bible is being changed by a supernatural quantum effect. It's a bunch of nonsense I ever heard. But there's Christians falling for this false doctrine And I want to read this right here. This is, this is the final judgment. Now, um, as we, we're going to go to verse 11. As we read this, I want you to understand, there's two judgments when Jesus comes back, only two. The first one when he returns is the Christians. The Christians will be judged. All right? Some will make it into eternal life, some will not. Thousand years, millennial reign, I believe a literal millennial reign is going to happen. It didn't happen it was in some Tartaria nonsense that happened a long time ago, okay? But there's going to be a little thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning on the earth and us with him, all right? At the end of that, Satan will be loose for a short season. He's going to cause another rebellion that God's going to end quickly by just raining down fire upon it, okay? Once that happens, it says, then... The wicked, dead, and everyone else is going to be judged. Now, let's read it from there. This is the second judgment. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the, somebody say books. No, we, are, we always talk about the book of life. No, there's other books. All right? There's other books. It's not just the book of life. Let's just read this. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Somebody say books. According to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, what do you see right now? You're going to be judged by the books. Not just whether your name's in the book of life, but your name, you're, you're going to be judged by books. And here's the books you're going to be judged by. There's 66 of them right here. You will be judged by this book. I love people say, don't judge me. I say, I don't have to. This right here does. This right here, this book exposes your sin. It, it exposes your motives. It exposes everything. And when you stand before God, whether it is when Jesus first comes back at Armageddon, as a Christian and you are judged or you are judged a thousand years later, you are going to be judged by what is written in the books. And, you know, Jesus warned the church of Sardis. He said that if you don't get the sin out of your life and your, your, your defiled garments, if you don't get them clean, your name's going to be blotted out of the book of life, meaning it was in there and then it got erased. And this spirit of Jezebel comes to make sure that happens. Listen, Satan is after your soul. He wants to get your soul and get you eternally damned. That's what he wants, to separate you from God forever. And he has to do that by seducing you, deceiving you, luring you, especially if you're a born-again Christian. He's got to lure you away from the truth, lure you away from a good church, lure you away from the Word of God. And it's done by seduction. It's done by subtle, false teachings. And then before you know it, you're into all kinds of sin. Because, see, here's the thing about it. What you believe in your heart is what you will eventually do. If you believe that God will separate you from him forever, if you want to be a fornicator, an adulterer, a homosexual, a liar, a thief, if you, if you understand the scriptures on that, you go, I don't want to be that. I know the Lord will keep his word, and that, that fear of the Lord will keep you from just indulging. But if someone's taken that away from you by a false teaching, they've seduced you, why repent? Why live holy? Why fight the flesh and the desires of the flesh? Why resist temptation? Keep smoking the dope. Keep drinking the alcohol. Keep sleeping around. See, we, we, recently, we recently had a Jezebel come in here and seduce one of our church members. You say, well, how do I know she's a, she's a Jezebel? by what came out of her mouth and by what she's doing. Because she comes in, right, to my office. Of course, they've been spending the night with each other in the same bed for months. Supposed to, say, supposed to be Christians, right? Other brothers here in the church talked to them several times. And finally, I knew, I knew I was going to have to confront it and deal with it because I can't let that go on. All right? But when Jezebel came and sat in my office a few weeks ago, here's what came out of her mouth. When I said, they, they, you know, I, I love it when these people shack up together and sleep in the same bed and they're not married, and they want to tell me, well, nothing's going on. We're not having sex. That's what I hear. You know how many times I've heard that? But they got one problem. There was a command in the Bible. Put up first... Thessalonians 5.22. This is not a suggestion, y'all. It's a command. And either you have respect for it 
And you're going to obey it as a Christian or you're not. And here it is. We go. First Thessalonians 5.22. Simple verse. Somebody say, read it with me. Abstain from all appearance of evil. I love how the Holy Spirit had Paul throw in all. Just to make sure you weren't confused. All. And guess what? You look up all in the Greek, and guess what it means? All. all. Yeah, exactly. Y'all are smart in here. <laughs> now, if you're a Christian, and you're shacking up with somebody, that's the old term, and you're sleeping in the same bed, and spending the night at each other's house, and sleeping in God knows what, and getting up in what God knows what pajamas, and taking showers, and getting ready for work, and, and you're attracted to each other because you want to get married, you're going to tell me nothing's going on. As the old saying goes, I was born at night, but not last night. And before, y'all believe it or not, before Pastor Dean got right with the Lord, I lived in all that sin. But folks, I want to tell you right now, when I said, when I held up this verse to Jezebel in my office, when I held this verse up and said, abstain from all appearance of evil, what came out of her mouth was, well, evil is everywhere. Everybody's doing it. So it, what we're doing is not that big of a deal. Strike one. Number two came out of her mouth, judge not. You, who you, you can't judge me. Oh, I looked at her fiance that she is seduced from our church here and i said you ought to know better you've been in our church a long time that judge not from uh matthew 7 in fact put up matthew 7 we're gonna do a little teaching real quick matthew 7 verse 1 on down through about verse whatever it is six or seven we're gonna read that but i told him said she don't even know this so so she had a false doctrine came out of her mouth that basically says, you can't, you can't confront me or correct me or, or deal with this because you're not supposed to judge not. I said, that's the world talking. The world says, oh, they love this verse right here. Judge not that you be not judged. Oh, that's, they love taking that right there and throwing that out there, right? First of all, they don't understand the word judge. It means to condemn someone. To condemn someone means not that you correct them or say they're doing something wrong. It says that there's no hope for them. You sentence them. All right? But we are supposed to bring rebuke and correction and instruction and even church discipline if necessary. Because let's keep reading. Judge not that you be not judged, for with a judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Keep going. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye and considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye and behold a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, let's stop right there. Nowhere does it say that you should not help your brother get the sin out of their life. But, folks, if I am in fornication or adultery, I have no right to sit down and try to tell somebody else they need to get that out of their lives. That's what this is about. It's not that we don't help people get out of sin that we have gotten out of. It's about hypocritical judging. It'd be like saying, you, you know, going and saying, brother, you need to quit smoking cigarettes while you smoke two packs a day. Right? That's what this is about. This is about telling somebody, oh, oh, you shouldn't get drunk when you're still getting drunk. Oh, you shouldn't be an adulterer while you're, you you got a honey on the side. That's what this is about. And any Christian that's read this or studied this knows what this is about. But the world says, oh, judge not. Why? The world, the worldly person, the unsaved person, or the wicked Christian, they don't want their sin confronted. and They don't want to be told they have to repent and get out of it because that's uncomfortable to them. So Jezebel sits in my office, 
and says, judge not. False doctrine. But then this was the kicker. So I tell Jezebel, it's time for her to leave my office. This is when you know, right? And I'm just going to have to tell y'all, sorry, my house, my rules. And if I tell you to get out, you best get out. Or it ain't going to be pretty. I was one breath away from calling the cops and have her forcefully trespassed and removed. Because I told her to get out of my office, she wouldn't get out, kept running her mouth. So then it got a little louder, got a little louder. Jezebel, and see, here's another thing. Some people think that I'm a little too strong sometimes, but I'll tell you why I'm strong. Because I'm not going to be intimidated by that Jezebel spirit. No man's going to intimidate me. No woman's going to intimidate me. Nobody's going to push me down to be quiet or to... Right. So on the way out the door, as I'm telling her to get out rather loudly, she starts down the sidewalk here and says, the only reason that you're doing this is because I'm black. Oh, see, here's another thing that Jezebel does once she's confronted and she's exposed. She did attacks. Now, I think anybody that has known me for any amount of time knows that the last thing on this earth that I am is racist. In fact, how I met Troy and Dee is I was one of the few white people that went to an all-black church for a season. I can't stand racism. I can't stand prejudice of any kind. And I was blown away. But see, what it showed me, too, is she has no discernment. She is operating in another spirit. And that's usually what happens. People in the spirit, remember, again, they, they throw out these threats. Now, she might go from here and try to say, oh, we're racist. Folks, I've had people come in. Where is Sandra? Several years ago, her and her now ex-husband, because he cheated on her. But her and her husband walk into church one Sunday morning. She's white. He's black. Will you marry us today? Because I told them, basically, Peter, get off the pot. It's time to do, make, make this thing right. And they respected that. And they walk into church one Sunday morning and say, will you marry us today after church? So I preached my sermon. We did our praise and worship preaching sermon. And I marry a black man and a white woman in church. Does anybody for one second think I'm a racist? <laughs> but isn't it, this is the crazy. Isn't this, this is what I'm talking about. The spirit of Jezebel, what is she? She threatens Elijah, right? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. You're going to be dead. Now, here's what blows my mind. Is that Elijah let that settle into him. See, I'm going to tell you, I got more of the spirit of Jehu than I do Elijah. <laughs> Say he rides furiously. It's got to be him. Yeah, that's right. See, the difference, Elijah let it intimidate him a little bit. Jehu was like, we're riding into town and we're going to deal with this problem. And so if, if that offends you, if, you, if, if strong leadership offends you, you won't make it here long. Because we got, we're, we're Jehu here. Or Jehu, however you want to say it. Because I'm not going to tolerate that spirit. I'm not going to tolerate it trying to slip in and contaminate our prayer meetings. Or let it slip in like one trying to seduce me into sexual sin oh we have them all try to slip in no i'm at war with the jezebel spirit she's not going to take me down you understand that and you got to say no to her to that spirit you can't let that spirit lure you seduce you into false doctrines 
lure you into sexual immorality, having a loose idea of God's standard, losing the fear of God. And you can't definitely let that spirit lure you into hating true Christians and true prophetic people and true prophets simply because you, you can't stand the fact that they will confront it. Boy, there's a lot of Christians completely in bed with Jezebel. Remember what Jesus said? Go back to that. Go to back to Revelation 2. Go back to the church of Thyatira there. What does he say about her? And this, and, and this, this is it's, it's 5 to 12. Like I said, I'm keeping y'all from being Baptist and Lutheran. All right. We're not going to get out at 12. <laughs> Let's read this again. Unto the angel of the church of the, not Ephesus. Go down further. Thyatira, 18. Unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, his feet are like unto fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest or allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So there's a, there is a patience period. That's why I didn't confront them on day one. I knew what was going on because I discerned it immediately. I didn't confront it because I gave them space to repent. Here we go. Keep going. He says, now here's what I want to get to. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation or trouble, except they repent of their deeds. Keep going. And I will kill her children with death. Now you need to listen closely. If you get in bed and stay in bed with the Jezebel spirit, you bring yourself under the judgment of God. And there's going to be great trouble, and there could be even great tragedy in your life. Because you do not get to speak against, hate, despise, undermine, be a stumbling block, and God to leave you alone about it. He will judge you. I've seen Christians. I've seen this happen so many times. I cannot count. I knew a, a, a woman years ago in a church in another town, another city, and she got, she got under this spirit, took over. And the next thing you know, what? She's running around. She's not, she's not living for the Lord. She's starting trying to find men she can lure into adultery. And then the next thing you realize, see, all of a sudden she starts hating the church and the pastor she's in because he preached righteousness. Then she starts telling lies about the pastor around the city. Full Jezebel spirit at work. But Jezebel then goes on a cruise. Because Jezebel likes to also party a little bit. And Jezebel goes on a cruise and starts flirting with a guy who snatches her off into a place where nobody can see or hear and beats her and rapes her. How do I know this? Because she came back crying to me about it. See, I was her pastor. And had she not succumbed and given herself over to that spirit, she wouldn't have been in that place. She wouldn't have been in that with that person. None of that would have happened in her life. She opened the door to that. And she was lucky to escape with her life. It was bad. She was beaten really bad. And those of you who know, a man beating on a woman, one, one strong punch 
can kill. See, she, she, she was in bed with this Jezebel spirit. She embraced it. Can't do it. Anything, any spirit trying to seduce you into false doctrine that eases your conviction and idea about sin and the consequences of sin. Like there's false doctrine going on right now that there's no, nobody's going to hell. Ultimately, everybody's going to go to heaven. There are preachers now. There are Christian churches teaching this. What does that do immediately? That begins to remove. Look, look. I don't go out here. You know, we, we have laws like DUI laws. We have laws about murder. Why? Because, you know, you might be tempted. Everybody gets tempted to do things. But that law is there, and the punishment or the penalty for breaking that law is there to be a deterrent. To go, you know what? If I do this, I might have to pay a terrible price. And so that stops people from doing it. Eternal damnation, eternal punishment. Hell was not created for us. It was made for the devil and his angels. But the Bible clearly shows that people who re refuse to follow the Lord, to obey his commandments, to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and become true disciples, that they will go to hell and then the lake of fire forever. And it's not a place where you're annihilated or cease to exist, where you, there is no more consciousness. It says the smoke of your torment will go up day and night forever, and you will have no rest. So if you want to be a fornicator, an adulterer, a covetous idolater, a thief, a liar, you want to be a violent person, an abuser, you want to be a homosexual, a transsexual. You want to go down these roads of evil and wickedness. There is a place of eternal damnation and punishment. But we've got Christians. No, that's not it. You just cease to exist. Not what Jesus taught. Not what the Bible teaches. But they'll take scriptures out like hell means the grave and this. And it's just the grave. And I'm like. Obviously, they haven't read Luke 16 where Jesus said the, the rich man and Lazarus story where Lazarus and the rich man both die. And Lazarus, the poor, humble beggar who was obviously righteous and right with the Lord, ends up in paradise. And there's a great gulf fixed between them. And the rich man lift up his eyes in hell. He's tormented in hell, he said. Begging that Abraham would let Lazarus come over and give him one drop of water to cool his tongue. He said, I am tormented in this flame. Jesus made it clear. So you can, you know, there's people that have, you know, had terrible things happen to them. And they want to go out and just murder folks. That did those terrible things to them. But they're like, you know what? If I go to go murder somebody because of what they did to me, what, what's gonna happen to my children? What's gonna happen to my grandchildren? You know what I'm saying? You start thinking about the consequences of your actions. You take that away from our society, you take it away from eternity then you've just seduced people to be wicked and think they can get away with it so you can't get rid of the doctrine of repentance holiness righteousness being a true disciple of jesus of eternal judgment and damnation of hell and heaven you can't do away with these things and say oh oh i'm gonna be all right let me tell you what that is that's the spirit of jezebel trying to get you seduce you and let me tell you right now there's so many false churches there's so many false and and weak pastors and churches in this country 
you find a strong church like this one. And listen, I don't care. I, this is not bragging. People tell me from all over the world and all over this country that watch thousands and thousands. We got thousands of people that watch. And they say, I wish I had a church like yours. I wish I had a church like yours. But Pastor Dean, you are rare. I mean, there used to be pastors. There used to be Leonard Ravenhill and David Wilkerson and Keith Green that would preach like this. Jimmy Swaggart. There used to be. But most of them are gone. Most of them are dead now. I know the Lord when I was a young man told me I would carry their torch on. But we got people that turn against me because I tell them, get out of your sin. You can't be sleeping in the same bed claiming you're a Christian. You're a bad witness to your daughter. You're a bad witness to the people around you. You're a bad witness to the church. And you represent, if you go to this church, you represent Fire and Grace Church to the community. They're going to think, if I let this go on and do nothing about it, they're going to think, I, I'm okay with this. Like the rest of these weak Christians out here and these weak pastors. No, I actually will put you out of church if you won't, won't repent of your sin. I will put you out of here. I know y'all can run down the road and find somebody that will let you come on in and do it. But you'll know that there was a pastor in the church that said, no, you have to repent. You have to stop committing this sin. You have to get out of it. You have to admit it and quit it. You have to confess it and forsake it. You have to change. My Lord, I love what Greg Locke said. If, if your salvation doesn't change you, it's not salvation. The first words Jesus preached when he preached the gospel, repent and believe the gospel. He, didn't, he said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. Old pastor, they'll say, Pastor Dean, repentance only means to change the way you think. No, it means a whole lot more than that. But I can guarantee you this. If you change the way you think about sin, you will quit sinning. You will quit indulging it. You will hate it. You will want to live for the Lord. I mean, to me, some of these things are foundational, folks. I was 11 years old when the Holy Spirit came on me and convicted me that I was a sinner and that the sin in my life was going to take me to hell. This was the work of the Holy Spirit. And that the only way to escape the damnation of hell, of an eternal punishment, was to repent of my sin. That I was guilty of crimes against God. And that the only way I could be forgiven is to accept Jesus and his death on the cross and his blood to wash my sins away. And to believe he rose from the dead. And to change, to repent, to follow him. To stop doing the stuff I was doing. God made that so real to me. And then, of course, at 11, I didn't fully grasp what was going to happen over the next few years when my parents divorced and they stopped taking us to church. And I get into junior high and high school and all the influences and everywhere. I gradually slipped away from that because I didn't understand fully. But when I was 19, the Holy Spirit came on me again, convicted me for three weeks. And I remember one of the, the words that that brother told me. He said, no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. He was speaking straight from Galatians 5. And I was a drunkard. I was a partying, drinking. Man, I could put him away. And I knew I was a drunkard. And when he said the word of God to me, no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God, the Holy Ghost conviction to hit me. I told, and I got mad at first. That's when I told him, I said, I didn't care if he was six foot four, 250 pounds. I was about to knock his teeth out. I said, we better just quit talking about this. And you know what he did? He, he didn't say another word for a while. I know he just went and prayed for me. Oh, I was one miserable person for a while. But when God kept working on me over those next weeks, it wasn't just. I remember he gave me some, some cassette tapes, just cassette tapes of an evangelist dealing with the satanic, the Satanism within rock and roll music. And it was just exposing it. And I knew there was some Satanism in rock and roll, but I really didn't know the depths of it. And I listened to this series. Now, here's what's so bad. This is when you know the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. And I'm thinking while I'm listening to this, these Satanists and these lyrics that they're bringing out of these songs, one horrible one from Alice Cooper. I didn't even know what it was about until 
oh, God. And I was like thinking how horrible they were in my mind. I'm thinking, listen, these guys are into every kind, in every kind of wickedness you can imagine. And the Holy Spirit goes, your life's no better. Whew. Your life's no better. I was like, oh. And then when he came to me and said, son, you can, you can have everything the world has to offer and go to hell. Or you surrender your life to me and live forever. I knew the Holy Spirit revealed I had to walk away from the sexual sin, the drug abuse, the alcohol abuse, the wickedness, the violence that I lived in. That I had to repent, confess those things as sin, and walk away from them. And in June of 1987, that's exactly what I did. Can somebody say, were. I love how Paul says that first Corinthians. He said, you know, y'all are drunkards and all this stuff. He goes down fornicators and he says, which were some of you? But now I'm not a drunkard now. I'm not an adulterer now. I'm not a fornicator now. I'm not a violent man now. Some people think I am. They, some people think I run around and beat folks up and I hadn't I ain't been in a fight since. I've been assaulted for preaching the gospel and not retaliated. You change. And if you're a Christian and you slip away, you get seduced by this Jezebel spirit. Recognize it and don't let pride say, uh uh, or false doctrine or your, your stubbornness, your pride, whatever it is. Don't let that just lock you in. Because as he said, he gave her space to repent. She didn't. That's stubbornness. Stubbornness. Mm -mm, I ain't. I ain't. I'm not changing. I don't care what. I don't care what the Bible says. Y'all know I've had Christians tell me that. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm gonna do this. Okay, slick. You're in trouble. People say the the written word of God doesn't matter. Psychos. No. First. First Timothy four. He, Paul told Timothy, he said, you give yourself to reading. You, give yourself, you study to show yourself approved. And then he goes on down. About verse 13, I think it is. He says, take heed to yourself. Yeah, here it is. Give it till I come. Give attendance to reading. Well, what, what do you think he was reading? Harry Potter? <laughs> Twilight? Or what's the new thing now? I don't know. He's talking about telling Timothy, you read the Bible. Give yourself to reading, to exhortation. That means correcting people and calling people near to Jesus. And to what? Doctrine. Keep going. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, but the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So don't neglect the gifts and power of God. And then meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly or completely to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Why do I preach an hour and a half, two hour sermons going through scriptures? Because I'm taking heed. I'm taking heed to myself and to the doctrine of God so that I might save myself and you guys. I will not stand before God as an Ahab that just let wickedness reign and did nothing about it and let Jezebel run wild and did nothing about it. I'm not going to be an Ahab. And my wife's not a Jezebel. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You start calling my wife a Jezebel, that proves to me you have no discernment, and the Jezebel spirit is actually upon you because you don't even know what it is. Pride and arrogance, I'm going to tell you. And so, yeah, you know, somebody said that the Jezebel that came here 
to seduce one of our church members, and she has succeeded in seducing them. But said that she didn't like my dealing with that family who followed the Jezebel out the door and started sowing division. She didn't like that. <laughs> of course not. Jezebel don't want you confronting sin and exposing false doctrine and exposing her. No. See, what happened was when I, she, she came about the time I dealt with that problem, she found out, oh, Lord. Her, her Jezebel spirit said, oh, no, there's somebody with a Jehu spirit. I might have a problem here, which is when I preached, she would just stare at the wall. She wouldn't look me in the eye. Y'all wouldn't believe what I can tell from your faces. Not only what, back in the day was I a good poker player, I have the Holy Ghost. It's funny when people come here and they don't want to, but they had to for some reason. I won't name the name that could be watching. But one just sat over here and stared at the wall while I preached. That, stared at that wall while I'm preaching the whole time. Could not handle it. And why is it? See, I've been around this thing long enough to... Yeah, see that white right there? I know a few things. As my daughter says from that commercial, she said, Dad... You, you know a thing or two because you've seen a thing or two. I've had every kind of seductress, false teacher, false prophet, Satanist, witch, new ager, government agent. I've had everything you can imagine try to slip pedophiles, try to slip in to churches and ministries that I had leadership of. I've been fighting that Jezebel spirit, that evil spirit for a long time. It doesn't take too much for me to recognize it. So just be warned. I'm going to go ahead and warn people that Fire and Grace Church, family here and out there, and some of you that think you want to come here, be careful what you wish for. Because you may see things you've never seen before in a church. A few Wednesdays back, somebody was praying and operating in a spirit that wasn't the Holy Spirit, and I told them to stop praying. Right in the middle of the prayer meeting. Stop. You're operating in another spirit. Now, is that popular in American churches? No. They wouldn't dare do that, ever. Because they're weak, Ahab's. They love their position as king. They're not going to jeopardize it or uh, upset anybody because they got to have the nickels and noses to pay that big mortgage on that big million-dollar, multi-million-dollar facility. And they're too chicken anyway to do it. Because we got a bunch of, as, as Arnold would say, we got a bunch of girly men in the pulpit, girly men. Won't f confront anything or deal with anything. I like what, because Matt, Matt Long came, I like that he pointed out that verse in Corinthians. Act like men. Act like men, not a bunch of estrogen filled little sissy boys. Punks in the pulpit. That's what Pastor Troy, punks. You know what they are? The Bible talks about effeminate. And we all think effeminate is just so for the, those flaming homosexuals that, that act like women. But, you know, if you look up the word effeminate that's in the King James in, in 1 Corinthians 6, it simply means part, the first part of the definition in the Strong's Greek Dictionary is simply to be soft. Soft. Smooth. Make everything feel good. It's supposed to be soft clothing. It just everything feel good. Of course, it also means pedophiles. But you can't have an effeminate, soft spirit and deal with Jezebel. She will eat you up, spit you out, trample on your bruised and beaten body. She'll dance on you. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus. 
I bind, rebuke, and command to go from me the Jezebel spirit. It will not control me, seduce me, deceive me, will not. Uh, somebody say hallelujah right there. <laughs> She's going to come. And let me tell you, she, she loves to come after people in the ministry. That's what she comes after most. She'll come after anybody. but She loves to take down her trophies. She wants trophies, ministers, pastors, apostles, and prophets. She wants to take them down. Now, that spirit, you need to be binding that spirit regularly. Remember? 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Seducing spirits, that would be a Jezebel spirit. Remember, what did he say about Jezebel? It says, she seduces my servants. Seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, that's a Jezebel spirit. Notice it says, you know, last week I quoted this. Go ahead and put this one up. This will be the last passage. I'll let y'all go. So. But for, uh, 2 Timothy 3, start in verse 5, you'll notice this. This is, this is when he talks about a church under the influence of the Jezebel spirit. This is what he says. He says, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5. Because I talked about this last week about those who don't hunger and seek after the gifts and power of the spirit. He, says they, he said they have a form of godliness. Right? They have a form of Christianity outwardly, but deny, reject the power, the dunamis power from such turn away. But let's keep going. What does he say? These people who won't operate, won't pursue the gifts, let Jezebel run the show. He says, for of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust. Isn't it interesting? That once she seduces the people of God into error and in false doctrine, that they end up in sexual immorality and lust. That's how you know it's a Jezebel spirit. Amen? Did y'all learn something today? This is spiritual warfare. This is one of the spirits you are up against on a regular basis. It will try to get you offended, bitter. It will try to get you to turn against true prophets and hate them. It is a powerful spirit, and you have to confront it, bind it, discern it, recognize it. And you say, well, Pastor, how do I do that? Well, the first thing to do is pray and ask God, God, I don't want to be deceived or seduced by the Jezebel spirit. Give me discernment. Let me recognize it when it's starting to attack me and trying to seduce me or deceive me. Let me recognize it when it's trying to divide me from my church family or cause me to get offended or bitter. Help me to recognize it. That's the first thing. You have not because you ask not. The more specific you pray about things, the better. Amen? The Holy Spirit will show you. If you ask him, he will show you. Let's stand. Hallelujah. I don't know. Y'all want to do a song before we leave? Okay. Okay. I like that. All right. <laughs> you know. Now let's do uh, I See the Lord Again. Because this is good. You know, I, I had this ready to go. I was going to pull it out here. You'll see what my wife bought me, a real one. Yeah, this thing is for real. This, ain't, this, this, isn't, a, this isn't a prop either. This will light you up right here. Because I was going to talk about the real Jesus. You know, let's just say, I'm going to tell you this much. The real Jesus, this is a real bull whip, y'all. The real Jesus, the, the real Jesus had the, had the Holy Spirit without measure. And when he walked into the temple and saw them violating and contaminating his temple, he didn't say, hey, hey, y'all, like Michael, hey, y'all. Won't y'all step outside, please? No, the Jehu spirit, Jesus made a whip. Again, 
Do you, do you really, if Jesus walked into First Baptist Church this morning of any city, pick your place. If Jesus walked in there when they were taking up the offering and said, you bunch of devils, you're contaminating my house. And started throwing their offering tables and their plates in the floor and took a whip and started driving them out of the church. They would have Jesus arrested. Wouldn't they? You see, American Christianity would hate Jesus if he really stepped in their church. Because he will throw tables over and take a whip and drive you out of his house if you're being wicked. That's Jesus. How many people, I asked somebody on, uh, when I made this post, the other day, I said, was Jesus being mean? I'm accused of being mean because I put unrepentant sinners out of church. I'm going to say, you mean, you're mean. I have yet to take a whip and pop anybody going out the door. But now I can. My wife said, but now I can. You're correct. I can reach out and touch you for a, for a little while with this thing. Woohoo! Oh, I know. Yeah. I'm going to be a racist now. <sighs> Y'all. Jesus does not tolerate the spirit of Jezebel in his house. He does not tolerate persistent, unrepentant wickedness. He will deal with it and i've seen people refuse to repent of their sin and, and sit in church and die i've seen it. i've seen people die before their time because they were stubborn don't let that be you what i love about this we're going to sing this song i see the lord again why i love this song is because isaiah was a man of God. He was a prophet of God. And he thought, I'm living pretty good. I'm living pretty holy. And then he sees the Lord high and lifted up. He sees the glory of God. And he goes, I'm undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. But then the Lord forgives him and cleanses him. And then the Lord says, who will go for me? He didn't say, hey, Lord, I'll go sit in the church pew or the chair. He says, here I am, send me. So let this be you. you got to hate sin and love righteousness. In fact, you all know that's the condition for the anointing of God upon your life. Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus loved righteousness, hated iniquity, hated sin and injustice. And because of that, it says he was anointed. That's why most of the church is not anointed. They tolerate sin and Jezebel in their midst and they have no anointing. But if you love righteousness and you hate sin and wickedness and evil, the Holy Spirit can anoint you. Amen? Let's do this. Nothing more important than Jesus following him according to his word. Amen? Nothing more important. Jesus, you know, I was over there when we were singing the song. Jesus is at war with the Jezebel spirit. And if you're on his side, you're going to be at war with it. You're not going to be at peace with it. You understand? It's a war. And we can win this war. Amen? We have the word of God. And we can have the spirit of God. We can be filled. But we got to have a mentality. I'm at war with this. I'm not Ahab. I'm Jehu. Right? Amen? Somebody give the Lord praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Quick announcement before we leave this uh, Fire and Grace School of Ministry. If you are interested in that, we're about to start going through applications. Need to be in by August the 1st. August the 1st. If you want to be in this year. And you can go full-time or part-time. Full-time is tough, but you are able to finish in one year. But most people do not do full-time. Uh, so it will take you two years, especially if you're working a full-time job. So just take that into consideration. 
We do let people, if they sign up for the whole year and they find out they can't handle it, we do let them drop a class or two and continue as a part-time student. So you can start and figure it out. And if we have to, you have to drop a class or two and make it two-year, you can. But I'm going to tell you, it's a boot camp. It's not, it's not for babies. Man, you're going to learn. You're gonna be, it's going to be intense. You're going to learn, but you're going to learn. And the, what the Lord had me create the school to do is just be very practical. Not to be get all out and fancy theological, you know, nonsense world. But the things that you need to be a strong Christian or a strong Christian leader in these last days. So if you want to be in the Fire and Grace School of Ministry, go to fgministryschool.com. Get those applications in by August 1st. You say tuition. Here's what we say. Tuition is optional. You can pay it. You cannot pay it. We don't care. We're not, we're not in it for money. Um, so it, tuition is not required. All right. Now, find another school in the country that does that. Yeah, if you have some questions, look on the facts page first and check that out. Uh, that might save you some time, sending an email, writing a long email. Uh, but if you still have questions that aren't covered by that, you can uh, email or call the church line, and Kelsey or one of us will get back to you about it. But August the 1st is coming up quickly, so get in if, while you can. Who knows? We never know when the last class is going to happen, at least one that we can offer online and around the world. So uh, one day it just might be you have to come here because we won't be able to broadcast or do online school. So anyway, God bless all of you out there, and y'all know the, the rule in here. Hug some necks before you leave. We will be eating downstairs if you want to go get something and hang out. God bless.